welcome guys back to um, my Watchers podcast episode seven, I believe. I hope I'm right for that. Um, yeah, so um, unfortunately with the current MCO and everything, um, we have to do the next podcast um, via podcast. And obviously there are a couple of interesting topics that came out in the past week. And that's something that we want to get uh, to the next session real quickly as well. Well, this is relevant, right? Um, so first thing first, as always, um, oh wait, before that, uh, unfortunately, Renee and team cannot uh, join us today, um, but that's fine. They'll still um, be with us for the next couple of, I mean, the next uh, session in the future, right? All right, so first thing first, uh, wristwatch check, right? So as it's Tuesday today, so for me, it's a no-brainer, uh, wearing the Speedmaster on a bracelet, right? 1861. Woody, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I did my Speedmaster yesterday. Um, so <laughs> just, just to wear the other chronograph, I'm wearing the uh, 38 millimeter El Primero, which I've been told it's discontinued. So it's uh, nice to know. Hi, yeah. on to you. Nice. Um, same, as, same as James. The, you know, it's, it's only fitting for Tuesday, the 1861 on, on the Uncle Seiko flat link bracelet. Yeah, nice. so I'm, I'm waiting for my 3861 bracelet in, in <laughs> anticipation. I'm sure Woody and James and the rest is also waiting for exactly. experimental purposes. Of course. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> We're wait. Waiting for that one and yeah. waiting for Renee or somebody else to get the Anka Seiko equivalent. Yeah, yeah. And that's a comparison between whether it's worth to pay that that hefty amount Ex- for that Omega premium. bracelet. Yeah, yeah, it's an extreme premium, I would say, yeah. It's okay. If, if experience shows Omega's bracelets tend a, a lot more solid than uh, yeah, anything yeah. else out there. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. I, I think that's the reason why I previously, like, um, I previously bought the Anka Seiko Flatling bracelet. I mean, but to be fair, that is a um, vintage inspired one and it's a hollow ending and everything. Um, I didn't like it. Right? I, didn't, I didn't feel there is um, su- there's lacking of heft um, for the watch and it's very top heavy and it feels very yeah. flimsy and a um, uh, lack of confidence for me to wear it. I just wear it three times and um, I sold it off to Renee. Yeah. Yeah. So I took each yeah. their own. Like, some people like it like some people like it that way. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the end link. If I, if I had a choice, I would have preferred a solid end link as well. Yeah. I heard that's coming. <laughs> I think yeah, that's the whole yeah, point. Yeah. Right? yeah, listening to you, James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So back to the... Um, the, the the main headline, the things that we want to talk about today. So for those who don't know, just a quick context. Um, there are two watches, right, two watches that released um, last week. Both have the somewhat um, controversial, um, one more than the other. Um, and we're going to talk about that today, right? So the first one, it's the Mink and Messina's collaboration for the another 1709 that was released. Um, and the next one is going to be on the Corona, the second anniversary um, watch, All right? So starting with the first one, um, they had a col- Ming had a collaboration with Messina to release a different variant of 1709, um, which was told to be discontinued um, depending on how you interpret it, they mention word for word this continue of this series. Um, but bulk of the people has to uh, misunder- I mean, at least misinterpret it or interpret it correctly, depending on how you want to view it. That the previous 1709, the blue and burgundy series, was um, expected to be the last 1709, right? And to put it out there, Han and I both bought the blue 1709, right? When they release it, right? And then this happened, right? They release it, um, the next another 1709 with Messina, with a different dial, um, slightly different um, design as well in terms of the numerals and so on. And it's more expensive and it's going to be shipped quicker as well. And it's limited, right? Very, so very, there's lots very of controversial limited, yeah. over there, right? So, um, with this context, uh, over to you, Woody. Fire away. So I think, let's just put it this way, right? Um, there's this very famous phrase from, I think, the Batman movies where they say that you live long enough to die a hero or you live long enough to become the villain. 
in my honest opinion, Ming has now become an arrogant supervillain. Now, let me contextualize why I say that. When they released the 1709 that the, both of you bought, the first thing that really, really didn't strike a chord with me was the fact that they didn't even show the watch first. They showed posters of a mock-up and told you how to order. No sign of the watch yet at that point in time, right? And they're already proudly telling you how to order, that they'll honor all of it, which was a blatant copycat of Corona to begin with. And to be fair, which we'll get to later, Corona came up with that idea as an apology to its buyers because their system failed last, sometime last year. Ming is outright doing this as a business uh, proposition. All credit to them, they, are, they know how to build up the hype. But that was the first pain point that I had with the original 1709 Blue and Burgundy, right? And so I actually went back to revisit that controversy that you mentioned as well, James. So what they put down in that email, the first email that announces the watch is our final series production 17 series watch. Now, layman term, when all of us look at it, it tells us, okay, this will be the last of it already. So if we have missed out in all the previous uh, opportunities, this is the time to get it. So that was some of the vibes that everybody got. So that helped build the hype as well. And yes, they did mention that they will honor all orders within a 10 minute period. So that might take a whole year, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, less than a month later, they released this. And we, we didn't put any comments out into, into the social media, but there were people that were out there that were asking, you know, didn't you just say it was the last one? And they have the arrogance to come back and say, you didn't understand our definition because we said serial production. And serial production basically means mass produce. So a collaboration doesn't count. But that's just outright insincere to the people that felt that this was their last chance to get it. So in that sense, I, I think for all intents and purposes, Ming has done really well for themselves. They... They, they are what every micro brand aspires to be, successful award winners and all that, right? But I think their success has gotten to their heads because they have forgotten the enthusiasts that brought put them there to begin with. The people that really want to support them and don't want to feel like they were cheated because this is another 1709, right? There's no hiding it. You just flip the watch around in 1709. You go to the Messina website, it's written in 1709. So for you to have said the final series production 17 series yes you can stand on your semantics to say that you're right but that's just outright insincere and i think han you were the one that pointed out that it would have been a lot better if they had just said that we might still have you know special limited editions moving forward but we don't know yet right that would have yeah. been more sincere i think um and but, but let me be, let me yeah. let me just ask in, in this way right so yeah. what if the watch was released not as a not as a 1709, right? I mean, it looks mm. like that. You could argue that, you know, if I don't call it a 1709, mm. then I'll just call it like a Ming Masena collab and I'll just mm. slap on any other name on it. Then mm. would that have been fine? Hmm. That's hiding it. Yeah. That's, it, yeah. It, it's very well, easy to see that it is because <laughs> when you look at the design, right, they were this very true to the, the crab like uh, Lux and then you've got a very unique center dial as well. So yeah. I don't think they were. I don't think that's really it. Of course, um, I do have another peeve about this entire thing as well because I don't think the one that you guys bought is an inferior uh, product at all. In, or by all means, they're all very unique. They're all very well executed. So what justifies the 800 US dollar premium? Another name on the brand? So is that just pure profit margin that goes to another collaborator? Like everything else is the same. It's the same Schwartz Etienne movement. It's basically a limited run that they did before this as well, right? And now it's an $800 premium and now it's a yellow and black m, &M right? Potentially and the, the DAO is harder to, you know, produce the design. Argue, I don't know. Argue, Potentially. Yeah. Arguably. But they make no claim for that either. You know, they, you know, usually when you're proud of something like that, right, you would then say that there was a special application to it. You know, the same way that they explained the 1709 blue and burgundy to you guys, right? It's like sapphire printed. So therefore, you know, the, the loom is on the dial itself. You know, that's what causes it to be a lot brighter, etc. Nothing of this year. It was purely a collaboration uh, using the same recycled art style, you know, that they did beforehand. And then they go out there, $800 premium smack. And 
here's the irony of the whole thing, right? Which I think is a real slap in the face one way or another. They had no problems with a time-bound 10-minute sale window to handle that many watches, right? That's actually hard. From an, I think you guys who have some familiarity with the IT system, it's actually hard to keep the system up to handle something like that. They couldn't handle 100 plus orders and they blame it on the DDoS, the denial of service. And for all intents and purposes, this is not your first rodeo. You know how to handle this. And if you can't handle this, right, this is a farce already. And yes, the lottery was actually suggested again by the enthusiasts, you know. If you read through the comments, right, you people who bought Yeezys and all that, they're saying, maybe just do a lottery. That's the fairest way to do it. But you didn't even think of doing that. And you had a second go at it. You know, it wasn't even a one-day fault. It was two days in a row. Yeah. And great to sell out. I wonder why they didn't just, you know, if they've done it before, I mean, they've sold it through the Ning website and they know it works, then why not just use the Ning website, right? I mean... Yeah, so, so there's, there's two stories to it, right? I mean, some people say that this is a Mercedes problem, um, mm-hmm. that say Ming should have just stepped in to use their platform or something like that. But what's going on to the background, I can't comment because I don't really know what's the true story. But you can't deny that this is it's a mess, right? Mm-hmm. And not only the that they convert it to a lottery, is the fact how they actually convert it to a lottery, right? Because um, they didn't have a proper system in place. It's essentially just say, hey, email me uh, your email address and we'll put you in the lottery, right? So uh, does that mean that I can start creating 10,000 different emails to up my chances? Um, Where does that, I mean, how does this um, in a way be fair, right? There's, Mm -hmm. There's, in a way, it kind of shows that there's no proper thought through to it, right? It just says like, ah, we're in deep shit right now. We will do something and it's like, oh, let's run the lottery. And it's like, how do we do it? Uh, just, just just get someone to put it in your email. That's it, right? Yeah, yeah. There's ways around that, right? You know, credit yeah. card details, address or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, if you've expressed your interest beforehand, you know, you were already part of the distribution list and all that, that there are ways to do it. They're smart people. They're brilliant people. And I, I fail to see how this catastrophe could have happened unless it's like, we don't care because we sold out and it will sell out anyway, right? So any which way seems better than others. And I will also qualify why I call them an arrogant. The word arrogant is very important here because of the way they've responded to the enthusiasts as well. You don't call out your fans to tell them you didn't understand the definition. Yeah. I also am aware of some people that have been outright rejected the 1709 Blue in Burgundy because they may have had a negative review of the watch before that. And you're like, I don't, you're no longer a friend of the brand. So it's like, wow, we are now selecting people who only say good things about you. Is this propaganda now? It's like, so if I don't like your face, I can't tell it to you anymore because you can't deal with it anymore. Is that how it works? Because I think for all intents and purposes, even a brand as big as Hodinki took it on the chin when there was that whole travel uh, clock thing, right? There are people came yeah, up to yeah. apologize and yeah. all that. So they, they did it. They had to do it, but they did it in a way that seemed professionally fair. Mm-hmm. But now you're doing this in such a way, right? It goes to show that, you know what, guys? I've got so much of you out there to buy my stuff that it's yeah. okay if a few of you drop off. You know, I can treat you that way. I just feel that's not right for the enthusiast community anymore. Yeah, that especially that one comment um, directly from uh, Ming Tian's uh, IG account. Yeah. I mean, fair enough. We are not, I mean, put it that way. I'm not a Ming Tian, so maybe I don't know, but this is just my opinion and my point of view. Um, there are better ways to handle things, right? I mean, like you say that if you, if you think uh, a consumer would have misunderstand it. It says that, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, or maybe you don't have to say sorry. It's like, uh, uh, be like oh, this apparently caused a misunderstanding between what we phrase it, but actually what we're trying to mean, uh, what, we, what we meant was that this meant that this was the last series or something like that. Yeah. But instead of taking that approach or taking the high road or something like that, what has gone around to do is like, oh, um, what was the exact phrase? Uh, I, I'm sorry uh, if it, it was pretty harsh. We can't, uh, to, we can't, to, we can't control. You can understand. Yeah, we can't control your understanding of our, your interpretation, our, uh, right? our, yeah, our yeah, yes. interpretation. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, it's uncalled for. It's like, there's no reason to do it aside from pissing people off or 
blatantly stating that hey i'm right just deal mm. with it right i mean yeah. you, you what 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 are you trying to gain out of it uh mm. aside from from really proving that oh yeah uh what i say is true what you say is wrong i mean it's mm. really i, found, I, I yeah. mean i can't process it like basically yeah. i found it i found it a bit odd as well um the, the question was asked a lot in in, in a few consecutive posts and mm. and all of the replies just came directly through the accounts to reply on top of the comments, right? Mm-hmm. You would imagine that if if something like that was asked so many so many times, and if it's really an interpretation issue, then you know why not make a more public announcement to say that, hey, we understand that there may have been a misunderstanding, and this is what we have meant, and then you know, but none of that was done, and and that's why when I was trying to look for those information, I had to go and scroll through all the comments. Then and yeah, I found all these comments, which which were frankly, as as we are saying here, is a bit nasty, lah. Yeah, mm. and and to be fair for the watch enthusiasts, none of I mean the initial stage at least, a bulk of them were just asking the question nicely. Is that like, hey, um, I thought this was discontinued. They wouldn't say it's like hey, why did you put this? It's like I buy it because it discontinues. Like why? How can you do such thing? There's, there's no comment like this. The the the, the, comment, the people that comments it are legitly asking a question because they were, um, in a way, quote unquote, misinformed or misunderstood what the release of seventeen or the seventeen oh nine blue and burgundy was for, right? It could be all cleared up just as this, just like that. Right, but instead, mm. it's like the, this whole kerfuffle that happens, and there's back and forth, and then people just start looking at the nasty comments, and bulk of them got really turned off, right? Mm. Especially their reply back to, uh, to to Ming be his own IG page and the whole logical Ming page as well. Mm. It's basically I I will put it bad PR, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, I think yeah. all customer service one one will tell you that's not how you respond to <laughs> any customer, so. I, that's why I feel like it's gotten to their head. The fact that they're this successful, it's all a sellout, right? I mean, all things considered, they sold out. That's anything yeah. that a micro brand would want, right? Every piece is, is accounted for. But I think you, when you start forgetting how you got there and the people that are actually supporting you and wanting to support you for that matter, and like you correctly pointed out, James, they were being very polite as well. I think the last few questions, they were actually just saying that, you know, not that we want to cause any furore or anything like that, but could you explain how we could have misinterpreted that, you know, and all that? So I feel that that doesn't justify it. So that for me is, is my view of Ming. I, I mean, I joked with you guys that I hope you guys don't get banned for something like this because that's the, the track record of what Ming is doing, right? I, I'm okay to be banned because for me, as much as he's a Malaysian and we like to put our Malaysians on the pedestal, right? This is not some a Malaysian I'm proud of in the way that he's uh, behaving to the enthusiast crowd. I, He's a great businessman, great mind, one of his real genius and all that, but this is not how you treat um, the enthusiast crowd, just the ones that put you where you are today. Oh, uh, Then again, where, where it, we don't know whether it's him that's actually replying to it or his staff or whatever, but then again, he is in a way the face of it. Yeah. There could be something that comes up if if it's indeed someone else's that replies to it. Um, he could have stepped in and say that, hey, oh, apologies, this was actually mm. handled by the uh, the CS team or something like that. But what yeah. if he does something? But literally nothing. Yeah. Right, nothing. I, I, I wonder if it was also potentially, you know, um, I, I'm sure they would have worked on this collaboration from a while back. So I'm mm. not sure whether it was just an ordering issue, right? Like, like, you know, maybe they were supposed to release this first and then the and then That's the blue true. and burgundy. Could be, right? Could be. And, and could again, be. again, all this stuff could be very easily explained. I, I wouldn't really blame him. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you intended it to go out in that manner, but somehow it didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it happens, right? So Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's essentially the story. So mm. um this is our take of it. And um for those who are in the lottery for the Ming and Messina one that's uh, releasing on 1st of June. All the best to you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's all, all the I can best say. to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's a good segue uh, to Corona now, though. I think mean, that's yeah. also a very interesting one. And I will put, uh, I will admit, I'm a huge fan of the brand because of what they tried to do when they. Uh, especially, uh, I actually tried to get the green, uh, the Mori before this, and uh, it was just a frame that was unlucky not to know that they were going to do a time release. Was it, if not... was it the same time frame thing that uh, the 10 minute time right. frame was? 
So what happened was this. They had a limited number first. I think it was 100 or 50 that they were just going to do. And their site crashed as well, right? And within that same night, they apologized for what happened. And they said that, you know, um, because of what happened, a couple of hours from now, we're going to reopen it and we'll honor all orders that have that are going to be put in in the 10-minute window. On top of that, because we didn't want this to be hyped up anyway, right? For all of any of you that had successfully ordered and want to withdraw now, we will let you withdraw it as well. It's absolutely fine. We're not going to hold any restocking fee against you and all that. I even read somewhere that someone said that for those who were part of the original, who were able to get the first batch, right? And then the thing shut down and the site shut down. They said that if you now want to withdraw because you feel the exclusivity is not there, we are okay for you to, to let go. And wow. I think they were paid an amount back as well. That original group, they were paid, I think, 50 US dollars back as a apology from the brand. Now, wow. that's really what set the stage for them to, for me to, I, even personally, I felt that this is a brand that's trying to walk the talk. Because what the watchmaker Hajime has been always doing was saying that this is just something he wants to do for people who can afford it to make more of more affordable because he does a lot more high horology stuff, right? So the actions followed his words, right? Um, but this so, so had, the the yeah. 10 minute window that they added on, they yeah. decided that within hours, right? It wasn't something within like hours that. on the same night itself, right. and that's the reason I never found out about it because I gave yeah. up. It, it crashed, I gave up, I actually got to the order page. And then it just froze yeah. up and all that. And the 10 minutes went up. So I was like, maybe it's not meant to be, right? Yeah. I was told later, it was like, I think it was a 8, 9 p.m. thing. And 11 p.m. or an hour later, they open it up and they said they'll honor everything. Right. And they were quick to respond like that as well. So that yeah. shows a level of sincerity. Yeah. Okay. There's a testament to the fact that, you know, they, they, they're taking it on the chin and they're, they're, they're doing it the best right. they can based on the scenario that happened, right? It wasn't something that they... Well, it's very unlikely that he would plan this all the while Correct. just to you know, make more money. It's very unlikely. Yeah. And just curious, uh, you said that the original order was for like for like 100 pieces. Do you know... Yeah, 280, I believe. Yeah, they eventually landed on 280. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So and, fair enough, and they right? honored it in any way. La. So that was the precursor. But I think this recent one grade the line already. So, so I rewind back to the first statement I made, right? So in a way, unfortunately, I think Kurono has also become a little bit of a villain already. It's a bit sad. And let me say why I say so, right? I think they went in with the intent of recreating that same um, bus of the Mori. And for all intents and purposes, when you follow their messaging, they kind of estimated how many they needed to have to, to sell already. So I, my guess is somewhere like 300, 350, they'll be okay. That's what they thought. Um, and then what happened was they realized the amount of hype that was building up, right? So the likes of every single watch block, uh, Worn and Wound, Hodinki, uh, Fratello, everybody was talking about them before the launch, right? And they could see an avalanche coming already. But here's the, the contradiction about that I feel they may have missed altogether. I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt, but it's a bit hard. They were building hype themselves. If you followed their Instagram stories, I know I've got no life, right? So I've happened to follow it, right? 48 hours before, they may say 48 hours to go. 36 yeah, yeah. hours to go, 36 <laughs> hours to go. 24 hours, 20 hours, 12 hours, oh, 10 hours, 8 hours. Hour that, pockets, is, yeah. <laughs> that was building hype, right? You were part of the problem. If you didn't want to hype it up, you shouldn't have, you should have stopped that social media campaign altogether because the hype was building up before that already because people were covering it before that. Hodinki was in the last 12 hours, but everybody else was covering you already. So by virtue of that, right, you should have pulled the plug on that social media campaign, but you ran it all the way to the end, you know, one hour remaining and all that. You know. So were you really sincere about not wanting the hype? Because you so go out and say, it and say that. So, yeah. So, sorry. Han. The Mori, did that have any sort of marketing in the same manner or none at no, all? No, no. It was very quietly done. They announced that they were doing it. There was a hype. I mean, they tried to build it up, but they were a relative unknown then, right? So, they, I don't know whether they learned from it properly. I think they already should have anticipated the hype. But I think because they were not as well known, they were able to hit that about 300 within a 10-minute window and they were happy with that, right? They, they, they weren't expecting to do more than that already. So they went into this particular model thinking that they have the estimates correct. In a 10-minute window, they have the estimates correct. But I think they saw how it was going to balloon. And then they tried to cool it down by saying that, you know, you might now have to wait a year. Because initially, the, the time frame that they put was June, July. 
I think um, you guys were saw it, seen it. Yeah, yeah, which was one of the reasons why we were quite <laughs> excited. Yeah, quite as well, keen right? for it because it's like yeah. they were ready to order it straight away, unlike yeah. the the other the Ming that you have to wait a year for, right? So it's like they kind of knew already, but then they tried to cool it by saying that you know now that the hype has built up so much, we will may have to push it to six months to a year, but we'll still honor it. But I think it's a misstep anyway because you kind of if i think it would have been better if they didn't ride on the hype train so much i mean if by natural organic people are picking it up and then they tried that cooling method i think that would have been better but by virtue they were doing an hourly campaign to build up hype right that's that's like having your cake and eating it too like you know you're saying one moment that you don't want to build up hype but you are building it up anyway right you could have pulled the plug on that campaign. That would have been the easiest thing to do. I think that would have appeared more sincere. And then when you come out and then say that, guys, we're really sorry. The hype is building up too much. You know, we have to tell you that we your orders will have to wait. All right? Then that makes a bit more sense. But I think that part didn't sit very well. Uh, and I, I think by all estimates, I think they're looking at a thousand, two thousand, maybe. Uh, it was way more than that, right? Uh, so I, I, I'm the only one here that ordered it. Um, yeah. So I'll order it at, um, well, I probably shouldn't, okay, I won't give it an exact number. Um, I'll order it at like minute one. Um, it was at order number 4,000 plus, right? Right. And a friend of mine to order at minute um, three or minute four, it was 5,000 plus. And another person that ordered at minute six, it was about almost 6,000, 7,000 plus, right? Wow. So you are looking at, thousands of orders, right? Easily five, seven, ten thousand, right, in that range. Right. Mm. So it's it's it is a massive uh, increase from the previous one. Right. So mm. my take that's that's two I have two points of view for this, right? So one, yes, it's it could have been handled properly, uh handled better. Um for example, people were saying that they probably should uh allow a 50% deposit, right, for the ones that were expected to wait. Um, like a year for it, which is fair. Um, I think so. Um, they could have I don't know maybe um arrange a a, a better system that actually real, uh, allows you to to realize that okay, you are right now looking at this this amount of uh, period. Do you still want to wait, right? As the orders increases now, and then the time frame increases as well, so you can immediately know. Um, not sure if that's even possible to do as in uh, as part of the system, but one of the potential uh, solution. Um, but yeah, but definitely things could be handled better. But I still applaud them for um, giving full transparency, right? At least information were coming out. Okay, this this is in comparison to what Ming does, right? Yeah. The, so, here's, the, so here's a question, right? If yeah. if if the coverage on this corona wasn't that that high, the social media campaign and all that, mm-hmm. would we have caught wind of this product, right? And would we have known that this was happening and would we have, you know, James, you bought it, right? So I don't know. Mm-hmm. In in a world where let's say they didn't market it or they marketed it just the same as the previous mm-hmm. uh, the green down one, then maybe we wouldn't have caught wind of it. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Just something I just thought about. Maybe but I think. Maybe, but I think the point is they were trying to appeal to people that were following them, right? That yeah. was that yeah. was that's the contradiction that I'm trying to point out here. Yes, no, all marketing is good marketing, right? But when you go out there and say that I'm doing this for the fans of the brand, I want the people that really want the watch to have the watch, um, you don't need the campaign that you did. Because I think by just pure word of mouth. I think I was the first to share it with you guys as well because I was following yeah, them, yeah, right? Yeah. They didn't need a campaign because once they announced it, they uh, we already knew it was coming, right? And, you know, word of mouth is very powerful in an enthusiast space. So that was all that they needed. They didn't need that campaign. Um, and I, but I agree with what, uh, James, you mentioned about how they handled it as well. You know, I think they got a lot of questions, right? And they made sure that it was almost like in the comments that it would come up for sure that they directly address the concerns that people have about it and that at least shows a bit more uh, authenticity about trying to solve the problem but i i back to what i was saying previously so another thing that i in a way appreciate as well is this could potentially um in a way hopefully cues the flipper game right with 
comparatively from like a couple of hundreds to a couple of thousands, mm. where the previous one was so high, where it's mm. um, selling for what, 8,000 8, USD or 9,000 USD or something like that, which is ridiculous, right? For a yeah. watch that is 1,700 USD, yeah. right? That you're yeah. looking at like a good three to four times over there. Um, and with this approach, good or bad, how you depends how you view it. Um, there's the lead time and everything, which is bad for sure. But to me, one thing I view it as a, is, it's good is that everyone has an opportunity to own it. And a, it, a, uh, it's a very, um, in a way, a good chance that the flipper game will be cute with this method, right? So that to me, um, it's one of the positive things that I view from this. Law, right? hmm. Yeah. No objection to that. I think any th any thoughts on on that? You you didn't eventually decide on it either. <laughs> no, yeah, I I didn't. I think yeah, just just you know, in in the end, I didn't feel like it as well as you know with the whole Ming thing as well. <laughs> yeah, fair. It, it just wasn't really in the in the appetite space. Plus, yeah. plus my my Ethereum wallet took a crash as well. <laughs> so maybe maybe not such a bad thing. Yeah. yeah so in a world with, with especially looking at how um, difficult it is to get Rolex right now, mm. um, to me, any watch that uh, any watch brand or, or a watch company and so on that really allows people that wants to buy it to actually have a chance to buy it mm. really gets my respect for it. Was, was it this the first time? Was this the first time that this ten minute window type of uh, purchasing window was used by any any of this watch? brands or even micro brands I, mean, I would say the first were, right the first i think this is the first official uh pre-planned one right, right Ming, yeah. the 1709 blue burgundy and the corona mm. second anniversary yeah was the the first like yeah. pre-planned one right yeah. okay and it's refreshing to see it, right i mean like it, it is good yeah. i feel mm -hmm. yeah like that's that's i mean like i have tried several other limited edition as well and um, it can be a little bit disappointing not able to get kind of that, but I guess um, there's two perspectives to it as well, right? So some people like the exclusivity that they're yeah. like, oh, I'm owning the one out of 100 watch, right? Yeah. Um, for me, not really. I mean, I get a watch, I'm happy with it, right? To well, me, it's, it's the opportunity it's, to own yeah. it, right? It's still going to be one out of XXX, just that you don't know what the XXX is. And to me, yeah. that's also fine. I mean, there's yeah. still some exclusivity to it, right? Because it's never yeah. going to be produced again. Mm -hmm. And for yeah. me, I'm, I'm not too worried about the exclusivity part because, I mean, all watches that I buy so far, I've, mm. I've, I've, I've kept them all because I only buy watches that, you know, I, I know that I would like. So I, I don't really flip them. So from my mm. personal point of view, this 10-minute window thing, it, it works well. Yeah, I, I think so as well. I, I was very close to buying it as well. Actually, the only thing that stopped me wasn't really this entire ideology thing. It was just the fact that I couldn't see myself wearing that color. So it was like, <laughs> I really wanted to support the brand, but I couldn't tell myself, it's like, I like it for just the ideology of the brand or was it the watch itself? And I couldn't yeah. separate the two. And I was like, maybe I should wait for the next time they, they release something. Maybe it'll come in something that speaks to me emotionally as well yeah. beyond the, the intellectual side. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right. So, so while we're in the topic of flippers, right? <coughs> Sorry. What are your thoughts on it? Right? I mean, most of us will say no and everything um, because like this make is very expensive to own it. Um, but elaborate on that. Like, why do you against um, such business or such actions and so on? I think personally for me, I, I kind of, Covered this in one of the previous episodes, and I still stand by what I said. If if you flip, so so, if you're buying a watch purely just to flip it, then I think that's really going against what all of us enthusiasts are trying to do here, right? Um, but if it's you know you're buying a watch, you're a, you're a watch lover, and you end up having a lot of watches, but and then you end up deciding that you want to rotate or something like that, and then by all means, that's well, then by definition for me at least, that's not a flipper anymore, right? You're just someone who, who does that. Uh, in, in terms of fuel, fueling your hobby or, or funding your hobby in a way. And, and I used to do that in, 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 in the sneaker space where I used to collect a lot of sneakers. So I wouldn't call myself a flipper either because I, I buy them because I, I genuinely like them, but I end up selling them. And if I make a profit, great, right? If not, normally I make a small loss and then 
that still works towards me getting the next uh, pair, right? So I think for me, that's, that's, that's where I stand in terms of the principle. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, to, to me, the, um, I would say if you buy it in the right way, you buy it fair and square, no hanky-panky or anything, that's totally fine, right? Because I mean, you are entitled to do whatever you do with your purchase, right? Um, where I have issues with it is where people start doing backdoor deals, right? People start acquiring products um, in, in a way a not legit way, right? Which in a way create an unfair advantage in the market or creates um, a, a prevents, a presents an unfair buying opportunity to everybody, right? Um, so that is where I have issues with, right? Up to me, if you if you join it, say if you join a draw, a lottery for a Ming and then you end up getting it, and then um, you you are a watch lover yourself, but then after looking at it, you decided that this is maybe not for you, and you sell it. So be it. I mean, yeah, that's, that's totally, totally fine with me yeah. because mm. to me, it's like. Uh, you are not doing this as a business. You are doing this to get funds to buy another watches because that watch turns out to not uh, not be um, actually what yeah. you wanted and so on, right? So that it's um, in a way my take of it. Hmm. Yeah. I used to have a much stronger view of this, but I've mellowed down a little bit, maybe more in tune to what you guys are saying as well. So my stance is as follows. I think if when you buy it, it's because like how you all said it, if you like the watch for what it is and you like it, right? And you bought it and then you ultimately decide it's not for you and you move it on and you just happen to profit out of it. That's great on you. That's like a good call, right? That happens to be a good call. That my peeve with the scenario is with people who do this. One, they buy it with the knowledge it retains value because they buy it as part of the principle, they bought it because it retains value. They then flip it for a profit and they go out to the public and say, oh, the prices of Rolex are so high and all that. I look you in the eye and I say, you are a bloody hypocrite. You are feeding the system right now because if you were genuinely an enthusiast who just bought it without the, con the consideration of flipping, right? That is different because it happens to be market forces at that point in time. But if you know, like you're looking at this watch, oh, I buy this, I know for sure I won't lose money. I will be able to retain it. Then if I don't like it, I will just sell it. You know, it's like, that's already in the factoring of that watch, right? Then you, it's okay yeah. for you to do it, but don't come out to the public and say you're unhappy with prices and unavailability of watches because you are part of the problem. And as long as you don't complain about it, you acknowledge it, that's how you like to play with that hobby. I'm also, I can make my peace with you as well. Just don't go out there and complain about difficulty of getting Rolexes and all that because I'll look you in the eye and tell you, you are part of the problem. You're not solving it. Fair enough. Fair, fair, fair. Yeah. So the 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 thing with this, right? Um, that's like with all the gray markets available and resellers and everything. Um, looking at a very neutral perspective, I do see, uh, and you can say positive side that comes out of this, right? Hmm. Um, the positive things is um, you have in a way the vintage game is a lot stronger, right? With hmm. this, you have watches that were made readily available or, or more accessible um, to people that are willing to collect this, right? You have people that would go out of the way to source these watches and to resell it down to you, right? So in a way, accessibility, you can't deny it. It is um, better, but definitely pricier as well, for sure, right? And on, on that note on value, right? I'm not sure um, about you guys, but to me, I do have this thinking as well that um, it in a way allows me or in a way an uh, excuse for me to uh, make my watch purchase, right? So I can, I, I, was, I will go into the mindset that, hey, um, it's okay, I'll just buy it, right? I'll wear it for one week, I'll wear it for a month. Um, even if I don't like it, um, I would, I would, I would, I can sell it. I won't make a loss, right? So to me, uh, I, I use this, you know, I don't know good way or bad, but I use this as an excuse to enable myself um, to buy watches, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, that's just my thinking. At least I, I will, I, I will go in as, uh, I, I mean, I won't be so hesitating to to continue to search for my next piece. I think uh, your the. 
for it to be an enabler to look at watches that you never considered before, I think that's ultimately a positive because um, it used to be where looking at vintage used to be so difficult because you don't know what you're getting, right? Um, and now with a lot more authorized uh, resellers or rather vintage um, or pre-owned watch uh, uh, people that actually check out, out the watch properly for you, give you a warranty and all that. I think that ultimately is a good thing for the industry because it, it helps keep things in circulation, keeps um, you know people being able to get, get products that they may have, maybe they came in late to the hobby, right? And then they like something that they can no longer get. That's a way for them to get it safely as well. Because otherwise you really don't know what you're getting. I know of Rolex guys who keep saying that it's a very difficult game to play, even before this hype came about, right? It's like, you don't know what you're getting. You know, it's like you have to really know what's in there, whether it's the real parts or not. And, and it's difficult, you know? It's actually the enabler part is a real thing. Yeah, um, but yeah, to me, um, we're talking to, to about about flippers and so on. I think we briefly touched about this in uh, last episode where Woody mentioned as well, right? On how can this potentially be eliminated or better, or make or in a way make better and so on, right? There's I don't know. To me, uh, end of the day, uh, I understand that hype is needed and the hype is good. I mean, without this hype, Rolex um, will not gain as much popularity as they 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 um, there is. I mean, they are right now, um, but definitely, in my opinion, and our opinion as well, if I could speak for us, is that um, there's definitely ways to make it better, right? Uh, like previous previous episode where Woody mentioned that, in a way, to keep better track in terms of ownerships and in terms of historical records um, that is being made available and so on. And they're, they're bound to be, there has to be a way to, to control it, right? Yeah. Um, where it does not hinder the sales of Rolex while making um, watch enthusiasts or people who actually want to own it, mm. own it at the right price, right? So yeah. the, this, the, that there, there, there has to be a situ the scenario where it's a win-win for Rolex and uh, watch enthusiasts and lose for flippers, right? There mm -hmm. has to be a way for this. Yeah. yeah, I think ultimately to your point, James, what we all of us can unanimously say is we just don't want these people, right, to have access. And all they do is they, because they're preferred customers, they get multiple units of the same watch and then give yes. it to the a reseller. That, that's not what yeah. we want. But ultimately, if a million people want the watch and we are just a million and one, right? That's fine because that's... that's right, yeah. And, and that's a system that's there and it's just our loss because we have to fight with so many people to get it. But mm -hmm. as long as those individuals don't exist anymore and the brands are doing something about it, I think that's the best we can hope for. Mm -hmm. For sure. Like you mentioned, like uh, how are you allowing someone that buys multiple watches um, of the same model multiple of the same model and so on and yeah so does that actually happen <laughs> at an AD to be honest I don't know but what I hear and what I think and I mean, what I can see my assumption is yes right yeah. based on the information that that, that about for, for what I gather wow. but in, in actual evidence I don't have any yeah. right so yeah, and I, I don't know whether it's a gray area as well because, you know, once you're a preferred customer, what will likely happen is if you make a request for something that's coming, right, you'll get it. But in a lot of times, these people just become an enabler to someone else because it's just like, you know, I can get it if you want it. Maybe you pay me a premium for it or whatever. I mean, nice enough, I, I pass it to you. That's still okay. But it's when you, it doesn't even make it to the hands of the people that really want it. That's uh, yeah. before it, the... the, the the price increase is applied. You know, if if it's getting to the people that really want it and the system is really working, then I I stand to be corrected. Right. To to me in this case, I actually don't blame the great dealer. You know, I actually don't blame them because they are just doing a business. They see a business opportunity, they're doing it. But the ones to be blamed, it's either Rolex or the AD that enable these gray dealers to able to do such things like this, right? Mm. Because to me, I the gray dealer did nothing wrong, right? They're just taking advantage of a business opportunity. They're good businessmen, mm. right? Mm. Uh, I don't like them as a watch enthusiast, but uh, I can see I, I can't see any fault of them doing this as a yeah. business, right? So 
Um, and, and one thing we've got to note as well is that why is it in scenarios that in Asia countries specifically, it's so much harder to get a Rolex comparatively to Europe countries and so on. That's the big reason why, right? It, uh, is there more shady business that's going down here? Are we getting less stock? I don't think so. Um, is there more, uh, in a way, backdoor deals and everything that's going on in the Asian market? No one knows. So to me, that is that is immediately a discrepancy that we can see, right? Yeah, yeah, people in overseas and so on, they will get, if you want, they put the name down for a sub, maybe definitely not the Daytona level, what just a regular sub, they will get it in maybe a year, maybe in two and everything. Yeah, and, you, you see a lot of, you see a lot of stories in, in like UGWC, the Facebook group where people say that, you know, they go up to ADs and they, they go and they can see the actual watch and then they have a chat with, with, with the salesperson or even the owner of the AD and, and somehow they get genuinely put on the list and, you know, it's just like a six pun weight or something, right? But for, hmm. I don't know, but like based on my experience anyway <laughs> and, and based on what I know, if, if in Malaysia you go to AD, chances are, you know, if you ask them for any stainless steel model, they just tell you none of them are available and, and it stops there, right? Nothing else is there. You, you look at them, they look back at you and that's it, hmm. right? The conversation just stops there, literally. Hmm. And it, it puzzles me that a luxury brand would want that sort of image of them as well. Yes, the exclusivity is great. You know, the, the brand um, positioning and all that is great. But at some point, don't you feel you don't want to lose your customer anyway? And you want them to feel that... I mean, the whole idea behind holding boutiques is to create an experience for the buyer, right? So if you're going into a boutique and you're not being treated with respect, you're not being, being rude, you're just going there and say, you know, are there such models? Is there a way to get it? And... That, you know, most of the time in this part of the world, they give you this look like, are you stupid or what? You know, it's like, yeah. why are you even asking that question? You know, it's like, I'm being eyed up and down. Do I even need to entertain you? It's like, yeah. Since when did, uh, does a brand want to treat a customer like that as well? It, yeah. It's very peculiar. To be fair, I've went in, done that once and I've never, you know, I've, yeah, I I've still go sometimes, but I've never asked them that question ever again. So it's quite off-putting, right? Hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. quite weird as a customer that's readily, you know, available yeah. to put this money down for <laughs> the Explorer 36, let's say, yeah. that you don't even feel like you can do that, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and to me, to me, it comes to a point where I even question is like, why why bother having a Rolex boutique store right now? That's yeah. yeah it's, it's a so furniture fun. store. <laughs> yeah. Furniture you have store. you have I mean the last few times I went in, uh, the store, Rolex store has less than five watches available at least on the shelf at least i'm not sure what they have at the back um yeah. every single uh store person i mean a uh, dealer sales uh, sales sales agent sales person um are playing with their phones mm. they're not doing anything there like best job in the world you know it's like no need to yeah. do anything <laughs> yeah. and they get to look you in the eye and, and and look at you like you're stupid right yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you that, ask them yeah that doesn't make any sense to me i think that's a i think to your point it's like if you have a boutique it's supposed to represent the brand, right? So there needs to be something there that makes you feel that, okay, you know, we're sorry you have to wait, but actually that's the reality of it. I, I know they're probably, the salespeople are probably tired of telling that same story over and over again, right? But I think at some point, you just need to make sure you don't forget the customer. I think that's the overarching theme I'm trying to get at. It's like, we are not asking for a discount. We are willing to foot up what the brand's asking for as the price in the store. All we are asking for is to be treated with a level of respect and we will not be rude to you otherwise as well. But that seems to be a tall order these days for some of these brands already. So, so yeah. actually, what's, what's in it for, for the AD, right? So is, is, is it purely because these guys, they buy more of the other less wanted watches? Mm, is that purely that, it? That is my assumption. My assumption is the, they you have people that are they are rich enough or big enough to have such capital where they can buy things in bulk, right? Literally clear up whatever stocks they have uh, and all your ladies and, and other models as well. Um, especially in these days, anything they can take is in a premium, right? It's, it's not like previous time where yeah. a two-tone date just you get 5% off and so on. Right now, a two-tone date just fetch 
one or two thousand ringgit premium already. Mm. So that's how, it, in a way, it, it's sort of uh, an artificial um, supply limitation has been created, right? Because anything that goes in never reaches the shelf. That is my thought, right? Mm. So, mm. and to be honest, the people that pays for rate are part of the problem as well, right? You are in a way yeah. either rich enough to buy it or, or impatient enough to wait to buy it. That causes this right supply demand, right? You, you, these people are the ones that are enabling the grey dealer markets to to perform or act this way as well. So that's why I personally, this is something that I I, I personally vouch. I will, no matter how much I want, I do like Rolex watches. I like how the way they feel. I like how the way they look and everything. But I will not buy one from a a reseller. I will only buy one from an eighty. That's for sure. If I do somehow buy from unless, reseller, unless it's this, a vintage, this, uh, right? this is a, your, oh yeah, yes. Unless it's a vintage, yeah. you know, a you know. Berthier Explorer, or whatever, right? You yeah. Can, then of course, there's no choice there. Well, I'll I'll just remind you one day if you break any of this, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> But this this episode is recorded. It's safe in YouTube and Spotify and everything. If I do happen to buy it, then yeah, I mean I'm willing to buy a bundle. That's for sure. Um, but bundle that makes sense for me, right? If you, I mean, I definitely as a, as a salesperson, it makes sense for all right. If you buy more, I close more. I I get to to in a way um, deal with less person, especially if all the hype and demand yeah, and everything. But, I'm willing but, to buy it a bundle, but a bundle that makes sense to me. Yeah, right. but isn't that also fueling the problem, right? Which is which is um, where we said that the AD benefits from that. Un- unless your bundle, actually. unless your unless your bundle is purely those watches that are uh, the ones that we truly want to get, right? So of course, mm-hmm. if let's say we remember want to get like two explorers and and another date just, but then suddenly they will say, oh, I want I need to throw in this precious metal one or this diamond date just, just to sweet, sweeten the deal for for the AD, right? Then would you still do it? Um, I'm not sure. To be honest, I'm tempted. To be very, very frank, I'm tempted, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah. But the deal, the deal. I, I'm trying to. I'm. Tr- I'm not even. To me, opportunity to even do a bundle, it's actually quite tough, right? For those who are actually uh, have some experience going to uh, Rolex and so on. Yeah. Um, but my ideal and realistic way of getting a Rolex, uh, getting a Rolex spot model, or even getting it. It's to have a bundle of watches that um, I actually would use, right? I want to get one for my girlfriend. I want to get one for my mom, which are um, yeah. a stainless steel date just and a two-tone uh, date just as well. So it's all within what I want to purchase, really, yeah. right? If it makes sense and everything, then okay. But to, to your point, if this is actually fueling or enabling the AD to, to perform in a... Or you call it unethical or something that's not right. Yes, to be frank, yes, it does. Um, and yeah, that's all I can say. It, it actually does. I have to admit it. Though. Yeah, but if your yeah, I mean, if your bundle is everything that you and your loved ones are gonna wear, then I think that's fine, right? The the the, the, the problem well, occurs when the problem occurs when they tell when you. you that, I think you were here's one the, that you don't want. Yeah, don't want. Yeah, <laughs> and then. Yeah, you'll get all the rest that you want, but here's one that you don't want, right? Well, <laughs> regardless, it, it's still, um, I have to admit, it, regardless of whether it's the, it's the watches I want or watches I don't want, it, it adds to the problem. It adds to the problem that you cannot just go in and buy um, yes. one piece, right? Mm. Yeah, that is, um, it, it is what it is, right? Um, but to me, that is uh, how I see it is, is uh, the best realistic alternative that I can work with, that I can live with myself um, doing something like this, right? So that's, uh, hopefully opportunity arises. Um, I'm not sure, but yeah. We'll, we'll hope, hope for you though. I think, yeah. I think it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, so, if, 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 if the bundle requires a, f- a few more explorers at the 36 mm size, yeah, you, you have two more people here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But speaking speaking of uh, boutiques and ads and so on, I think I spoke to you on on uh, WhatsApp. But this is I think this is something worthy to talk about briefly, right before we close off for today. 
uh, I think my experience in your know, JLC, uh, in the JLC boutique in uh, Pavilion, Malaysia, right? To me, that's an amazing experience. Um, so shout out to Shikin if you're even listening to our unknown podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but the experience provided there was, to me, eye-opening, right? To me, very, very eye-opening. Uh, I went in there with um, t-shirts, shorts, um, wearing a Speedmaster, nothing really fancy. Um, with my girlfriend wearing casually as well. I just decided to walk in to have a look at some reversals. We immediately brought to the section and they will ask, all right, what reversal are you looking for? Why do you buy it? Are you looking for a couple? Literally a bunch of questions that's come out, really trying to cater to our needs, right? And they will immediately serve water and brought into the VI, uh, I mean the backend section and various amount of watches um, that was brought to us to have a look. Long story short, we were never pressured um, to buy any watches. We were never really being hard sell to buy any watches. It was genuine conversation about watch in general and about our life in general. And it's an absolutely pleasant experience um, that I have, right? Um, so, so here's, if anybody, so, yeah. yeah. So here's a question. Do you think this is something is possible for Rolex to do? <laughs> Regardless of whether you can sell, we, we know that the watch is unavailable, right? But can you imagine just going there and they still sit you down and say, okay, I can let you see and I can talk to you about it. I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. this is the reality, right? Not in so, our lifetime. <laughs> not in our lifetime. Yeah. My, 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 yeah sorry, go ahead. Go, no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. My question is, it's, uh, is this uh, provided uh, such service from JLC? Is it because they're not as high as Rolex? Will they provide such service if they are as high as Rolex? Point. Yeah. It's a fair observation. I think yeah. that remains to be seen. But I can. Mm -hmm. Uh, echo what you said. To me, having been to a lot of boutiques in Malaysia, they are the, in Malaysia at least, the bar is not very high in Malaysia, but they are the standard when it comes to customer service in a boutique in Malaysia. Um, I, I, I give them hands down the, my vote every day, twice on Sunday. It's, um, they've never, never have I been in there and felt unwelcome. And I, I'll be honest, I, the only thing I've ever bought from them was just a official strap. And that was it. I didn't even buy a watch from them and they treat me like that. Um, I, I think there's something to be said about how luxury brands should treat its customers by just looking at the way they, they do it. Even if they aren't Rolex level hype or whatever, right? maybe they have to do it to build that, that image. But I, I'd say more to the customer, that's just a way brands should opt to aim to to appreciate customers that come in and willing to pay money like that for a, a non-necessity for that matter, right? So that that for me, I think James, your observation is basically replicated for whenever I've been there as well. Never have I had a bad experience there. Um, elsewhere, it's usually a hit and miss. Um, Rolex, basically no go. I, I feel judged from the day at the moment I walk in. It's, you almost feel the eyes being looked up and down from the time you walk in already. It's like, yeah, so I think more of that for all of us, if you think about it. <laughs> which, which is another question. I mean, another point I want to bring up as well. Um, for those who are, in a way, new to watches and so on, I want to really emphasize this, that Rolex is not everything. Rolex is not the king, despite the crown and everything, right? There are many, many, many other watches available, right? Hence, podcasts like this is really to op open the eyes of, of people who are really not in to the watch industry, I mean, the watch world and everything. There are many beautiful watches, many amazing pieces around that you can buy, literally. That's, that's the key point. You can buy, enjoy your watch and everything, right? You are, it's, it's most of the time cheaper than Rolex as well, right? Uh, either at retail or resale and the best thing it's availability and best thing it's the enjoyable experience that you get out of it right so do expand in a way your options look into various pieces and so on and if you do need recommendation reach out to us we're more than happy to help in a sense that i mean we were trying to um, in a way bring people into um, this community and i believe this community um despite what people think, it's not a community where it's um, where we judge upon people. It's like, oh no, uh, you don't have a Rolex and stuff like that, right? We, we Watches of all brands types is all welcome from 
Seiko um, to Rolex to Patek. I mean, from from quartz to mechanical, anything, right? That's the the beauty of it, right? Is to that everybody is able to enjoy it. Every watch has their own story, and everyone has their own preference, and yeah, everybody can just enjoy it together. The great way to end, James. Yeah, right. wow. <laughs> I almost cried there. Right. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, then. Yeah, um, yeah, so I think that would be it for today's episode, and um, hopefully the next one will be in person, um, depending on how the cases of COVID um, turns out. All right. So, um, lastly, um, for everyone, stay safe, um, take care, and we'll see you in yeah. the next episode. Stay safe and get vaccinated right. as soon as you can. Right. See yeah. you, everyone. Thanks, right. everyone. See you. Bye.